Okay, are we guys ready? You're ready for me, huh? I'm sorry for being a little bit late. Okay, this um, this presentation will be our last presentation. So I thought, guys, uh, we'll talk a little bit about generators and capacitors. And every time we talk about generators, they are tied to um, very important three systems that we do in the electrical industry, of course, which is the emergency system, legally acquired, and standby system. So I thought, lump sum these three standby systems and emergency systems together with the generators of course that's what we typically use generator for for one of these three systems that you guys are familiar with then i threw um, a capacitor sizing for power system um, in terms of sizing at the level of the load or sizing at the level of the service so two levels of of sizing the capacitor so that's what i have for you a couple of um and of course with generators come the auto transfer switches because uh, typically that's what we do in smaller projects so uh, you guys have handouts so in the hand the handouts i have the powerpoint presentation that i've done in the past and like i've done guys i always have an skm coordination so i thought the most important thing about generators is to coordination with the generator curve so-called gen curve so i have a gen curve for you and i use um comments i don't know what you guys use i'm sure you use common software when you size generators so i uh, um, I picked one of the projects that we have done and I uh, made a copy for it and I'll walk you right through the, how to size the generator. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, so please correct me if you if there's anything you would um, see different. So sizing generators and then I threw, um, I believe, three sheets for you. One sheet to size a generator installation as an um, overcome protection device and the conductors, the feeders for the generators, how to size them. And I would love to have some discussion around that, that topic. And another two sheets for sizing um, capacitors at the system level, the switch gear, service entrance equipment level, and one at the offender level, as in uh, motors level. So that's what you guys have. Cool? Everybody um, is paying attention to the food or the chat or both. <laughs> so uh, this is our last session. So I hope uh, I hope you guys will enjoy it. So a couple of capacitors, transformers. Um, like you said, every time in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, every time we talk about generators, it comes to my mind emergency systems. That's why we are not utilities, so we can we can have um, prime movers. They call them pri the the prime mover or continuous duty generators. We all what we saw is a standby duty generators for emergency system mainly, or legally acquired standby system, or um, optional system for customers. So I thought these are three articles, very, very important. The 700 image system, legally acquired 701, 702 is optional. Um, and they do have a sheet that compare between three of them. And of course, if you have a hospital, you have to have some type of an emergency system for your hospital. Um, and that will be part of the 517. And I don't know, Dave, if you guys ever worked on, um, on building that classified as a critical operation power system. This article came after September 11. So federal banks, anything that important to the survivability of the nation from a security point of view, as in military security, food security, as after September 11, they came up with Article 708 that could take these buildings and have tons of redundancy for them. Exactly like emergency system, but really tons of redundancy as a mechanical, electrical, and security systems. Anybody, did you guys work on 708? Any project that you worked on it that you can admit <laughs> without killing all of us huh <laughs> we have to kill you if we tell you right <laughs> so these are the three that comes to my mind a couple of things about um, power availability critical operation system that we have a couple of articles and you guys I have a few of these uh, there's um, NFPA 99 standard for healthcare facilities life safety 101 these will tell you where to put the uh, uh, the bug guys and so forth. There's 110 standard for emergency standby power systems and I truly believe 446. I don't know if you have some of these. I don't have some 446. I don't have it. Recommended practice for emergency and standby power systems for industrial and commercial applications. I truly has tons of information about um, emergency systems and so forth. But these are, um, do you guys, do you, um, no. No, not uh, 446 is not the color book. There is a color book that talks about emergency system too. And healthcare, I think the white book is in the white book that talks about healthcare, I believe the white book. So these are um, interesting topics, material to have um, as engineers, especially en engineers and specifiers um, that add more information. The topic, I 
is beyond beyond uh, this class. So here's what I have, guys. Uh, com comparing between these three systems, I have 700. So this is your Article 700, Article 701, 702. 700 is emergency system where people's life depend on it. 702 is legally required sent by system where people's life does not directly depend on it, but it's in very important for. Um, it, it's it's not. I always say the the first the most important system in your building is your emergency system, as an egress lights and egress um, um, and exit signs and certain elevators in certain buildings. That's your emergency for people and then above that becomes what legally quite sent by system what comes to my mind is um fire alarm uh, fire uh, fire pumps uh, jails certain uh, systems in jails will qualify as legally quite sent by system where the where the government decided that this system is so important for security whatever that need to be backed up by power so that's your legally quite sent by system versus emergency system. Article 702, standby system. This is Chad Curdy wants to have a generator in his backyard, so if he loses the power, when he finishes eating his breakfast and sipping his coffee, go flip the switch and turn it on. So that's standby optional. So these are the definition of all these three. Equipment approval. I thought that's really interesting. 700 has to be approved, the equipment as an emergency system, as in auto transfer switches and so forth. If it's 701, not, but authority having jurisdiction, of course, can override the not. So the second thing, restoration of power, very, very important is in 10 seconds, the emergency system has to come up, up and running and that will force you certain sometimes to have when we have five, six generators in peril, we force us to throw another little guy for emergency system because if it can, if the generator cannot pick up the load within 10 seconds. Legally required though, you need 60 seconds. That's, uh, that's give you more time to um, synchronize if you have to come up to speed, pick up the load. If you have a 702, whenever, whenever you finish, you can flip the switch manual if you want to. Any comments, guys, about the start of these systems and the difference between them? I thought these really nice sheet to compare between the three of them. Then transfer switch, you can see that if you're an emergency and legally required, they have to be listed and they have to be auto, meaning you cannot it doesn't depend on me flipping the switch. It has to be auto. If you lose the power for an emergency generator, that auto transfer switch, since that the power had been lost, start the generators, pick up the load within 10 seconds, like you all know. Um, again, for the standby, whenever, it doesn't have to be, can be manual or emergency. There's a, um, there's dedicated and listed, very important. The, the auto transfer switch have to be listed for emergency system and dedicated only for the emergency system. Um, the the legally required standby system has to be listed, but it doesn't have to be dedicated. It has to be listed as an emergency, but it doesn't have to be dedicated. Um, you can share other loads, other loads with it, other than the legally required standby system. So I thought that was really interesting. Priorities, of course, emergency is the highest, then the legally required, then the lowest is standby. Uh, permitted to supply other loads, emergency. Um, 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 only the standby, only the emergency load. Um, legally required, you can have optional standby uh, load on it and um, uh, permitted to supply other loads. Article 702, no. So uh, permitted to supply other other systems. So for this one, if it's optional, what they're saying for no, the 702, meaning if you have a um, standby system, you cannot supply an emergency system out of it, right? Because it's a standby system. So circuit uh, conductors isolation, you have to completely isolate, like we all know, the emergency system circuits and branch circuits and feeders from any other system. If it's legally required standby system, no problem. You can put, a, not like you would do, you put a conduit, three inch conduit, and you can put a bunch of branch or say a three quarter of an inch conduit and bunch of branch circuits, normal and emergency in the same uh, conduit and box. That's a major major change in terms of we construct the power system for legally and standby. Of course, standby, um, you can, you can mix them and match them. So connection ahead of the normal service disconnect means no, if it's an emergency system, you, you have to have basically a, you can't use the connection ahead of the service as your second source of power if it's an emergency system. If it's legally it's required uh, system, yes, and that will get you into the fire alarm system, fire alarm panel, how you can feed it from the line side of the service disconnect means. Um, of course, um, um, uh, no rules for the 70, 702, it doesn't matter, you can, it doesn't have uh, any any effect on it because that's your choice. Um, 
Separate service permitted, yes, if acceptable to the authority having jurisdiction, yes, if approved. When you have an emergency system, you either have a generator and the utilities, or you can have two utilities coming to your hospital. And I know um, 101 does not approve this one as two utilities. You have to have a utility and a source of power right in like a generator. So that's where um, yes, if it's approved by the authority and yes for the legal required uh, system. Selective coordination, you have to do selective coordination, over competition coordination for the emergency and legally required standby system required, not for the emergency, not for the optional. Uh, installation and periodic testing, all of them have to be tested. Obviously, the optional, of course, optional. If you want to test it, you test it, it's up to you, but these are must be tested. Uh, capacity, they have to be able to carry the load. Um, and signals and, si and signs required. I believe in 2000 signals and signs you have to have yes yes for both of these so you have to have a I have a picture of it, um, um, a place where you can signal what's going on in the generator if the battery is down or, or, or low oil and so forth for both of them not for that you don't have to do it for the optional ground fault protection you cannot put the ground fault protection on illegally or as in tripping legally or emergency system feeders, though you have to put indication. So you, when we have a ground fault protection, there are two, two levels. You can either alarm that you have a ground fault so the electrician can go take care of it, and that's what's required on both of them. It's This is what, this says no here. In 2011, they changed it. It says net, yes, if you guys want to change that, that one into yes now, that was changed in 2011. So you have to have an indication, an indication required for a ground fault. So you have to have a ground fault sensing if the feeder is a thousand amp, only if the feeder is a thousand amp 48277 system, then and you have to also alarm that you have a ground fault in both legally and legally and emergency system. Um, and in in the optional system, Chad's uh, generator, if my generator is pumping a thousand amp at 480 in my backyard, I have to put a ground fault protection that trips, not alarms, trips. Any comments, guys, about I thought these comparing. The most important thing about this is, yes, sir. Thank you. I don't take the claim of it. I took it from a book, but I thought it's very nice to compare it to the system. I'll uh, get you the reference <laughs> for the records. Yeah, summarizing the whole system. But do change this one into yes, because that was changed in 2011. The alarm, the last one is yes. You have to have it. Okay, so I thought just, so that's why I threw it with the emergency system. I thought it's really nice. Okay, with the emergency system, I know our topic guys, is not emergency system, but I thought uh, the cheapest, easiest way of having an emergency system is light, exit and egress sign. Um, the, they allow you to have self-contained battery powered units, fancy name for the bug guys that we're all familiar with. Uh, probably do we have a bug guys here? Is that one? There's one bug guy here. So, and there's the exit sign. So these will be connected. The most important thing is you connect them on the line side of a disconnect in the building. So I don't know when you guys, uh, uh, I'm sure you you know that. So when you have a disconnect in the area, here's my disconnect, here's my circuit coming in, my overcome picture device 20 amp. When I want to feed this light, I can come from the line side of the, uh, from the line side of a switch and I go feed um, my exit sign as well as my uh, emergency, uh, my exit sign as well as my egress light on the line side of the disconnect, not the load side. So you can feed it from the same branch circuit that feed this building. And I'm sure if you guys have, I'm sure you've done a lot of these, right? So that's the most important thing about these. They are powered, no generators. They have batteries on them. That's the second source. They have a little relay that flips up on the loss, the locally or global loss of power in this room, local as in Chad went and tampered with the circuit that feeds this light here. That light will come on. And um, if a storm knocks down the transmission line coming to your building here, the distribution the transmission line that feeds the area, it will also come on. So that's, uh, that's one option. Now, for uh, sources of power, legally required standby system, guys, and emergency system require two sources of power. <coughs> These two sources of power can be batteries, like the bug guys, or can be two emergency, um, two services coming to the building. It's hard to get this to qualify um, based on 101, the safety code, because does not, I believe in 101, does not recognize another service coming to the building as an, another source of power for the emergency system. 
So just the code recognize it, but the emergency code 101 and the PA 101 does not recognize it. So just be aware of that. Okay, so emergency systems wiring arrangement. Now, if you have, uh, so either we have the box, you have two services, or you can have a generator. Now, if we have a generator, what we can, what we have to do when we have a generator, we have to completely separate the emergency wiring system from the normal and the legally required standby system. Complete separation. Switches, receptacle, boxes, you name it. So kept entirely independent of any other wiring. They can't enter the same box. So if here's my emergency light here, you can see in the lineup, you can see how everything here is completely separated. I have a divider here between them. You can see complete separation um, of the emergency system from any other system, including the legally required standby system. Any comments, guys, about the separation? I'm sure you guys do it all the time. When you separate your emergency system in a building, feeders and branch surface and boxes and conduits, complete separation. The only time where they meet is if they are to enter a, a light, um, if this uh, fixture is to be energized from uh, an emergency circuit and, a, and um, a normal circuit, you have a little relay inside it, that's when, you, when the two circuits meet, right, at the fixture level. Any comments about the separation? Here's my um, other comment. If this is a legally required standby system, you don't have to separate them. Well, that's a major difference in terms of construction. Instead of two conduits going through the same area, you can have one conduit and group all the, the branch circuits in one conduit. That's a, uh, in terms of cost, that's a major difference. Comments, guys, corrections, makes sense. So that's independent. Now, uh, this is for the emergency system. Um, wiring arrangement i have legally required standby system wiring arrangement they can occupy that's a major difference they can occupy now i i being an engineer um i just because they can doesn't mean you should mix them up um as engineers guys the code is the bare minimum we we gauge how good our engineer the project is how higher we can go um, above the uh, requirement of the code. So if I am to design a system legally required, I would not mix them together, even if I can. It's nice to separate them. But though if you have a customer who is not willing, we all, I always tell the people, customers are always right, uh, even when they're wrong. So they're paying our salaries. If there's a customer who wants to cut cost, and um, as long as it meets the code, I will do it for them. That's kind of my attitude is. I will recommend separating them, but if they want to cut costs and they make it cheaper to affordable so they can hire us to do the design for them, I will, um, and it doesn't, it meets the code, I probably will do it. So this is where you can, uh, taking a feeder from the load side, here's your um, lo line, this is called the line side of the service disconnect means, sneaking a little feeder from there and feeding your fire pump would be, um, or any other system that qualifies an air handling unit that's, that the government decided that's important and we need it to be legally required by the government to be on, you can feed it from the line side, then you don't have to have another source of power for it. That's where you can um, you can avoid having another source of power by feeding it from the line side of the disconnect. This is only for the league required, not for the emergency. That does not qualify for the emergency system. Any comments, guys? Any questions, comments about that? Yes, sir. What can you tell your client when we design a building, you're going to maintain this building for 40 to 50 years, right? Maintaining it means you're going to turn the lights, change lights, bulb, and everything else. So, so that's number one. Think of the electri poor electricians who are going to maintain the system for 40 to 50 years from today, number one. Number two, think of survivability of this system. You have a legally required standby system for a reason, because you care about the power. So important, right? So if you mix them with another circuit, you have compromised the integrity of these branch circuits, meaning if there is a short circuit in the normal, could take with it the legally required standby system. So the survivability of the system and the ease of maintenance for 50 years. That's what I use. I don't know if you guys have any other, um, you know, it's easy to separate them, to track them, add to them in the future. I know it's cost, so ultimate line, the customers are always, unless, you know, you know, if they can't afford it, then we'll mix them. But that, these will be the two reasons I will use to separate them. Any other comments? So that's um, my legal required. Then I, I moved down, so I, I threw these guys 
fast just to talk about legally acquired standby and emergency. Um, and then we talk about generators. Um, and I, uh, I'm sure you guys talk to, you go to uh, Cummins, they have great parallel switch gear. I'm sure you guys, you, you've done it with us, but that parallel switch gear and interrupter room, they call it, it's awesome. I mean, if you haven't, I'm sure you, Dave, you guys have done there. So they do a lot of presentations. So I just picked up a couple of things about emergency generator sources. Engine type and fuel is very, very important, guys, with the EPA regulations and the survivability. For example, the gas line might not qualify as another source of power for emergency generator. You might have to have a diesel because any interruption in the gas line could um, lose the second source of power. So type of fuel uh, that drives the generator engine very important consideration availability and regulations affect selection of fuel as in gas or diesel typically diesel is the most for the most part common for emergency generators so that the fuel is a big deal and i will leave this one to the expert when it talks to the fuel but be the commonly is diesel is common gas uh, natural gas is another source too the cooling system you can use air to cool them or you can use liquid to cool them depending upon the higher kw they start cooling them by uh, by liquid to cool this system so the um, so the cooling system for the generator is a big deal. And the other thing generate in terms of uh, electrical characteristics for the voltage that we run at it have to match, um, have to match the voltage system of your, uh, of your building. You probably say, well, that's common sense. Sometimes the customers, guys, they have a generator 208, they got it cheap and they want to power the building that's 480. I don't know if you've been in these situations. Well, it's every time you put a transformer between your generator and your system, you compromise the integrity of that system and you have a lot of losses in the generator. So the, that's why we're through this one. If you have a system, uh, um, a decent system, typically 480, your generator should be 480, 277. If your system is 28120, your generator should be 28120. If your system is 138 or 1247, then it should be a 138 or 1247. But it's not. No, it's not a good, no, no, absolutely. You can have a 208 generator, step it up at a 480 and feed your system, absolutely. It's not a good idea unless you really have a reason for doing it this way. The reasons typically I've seen it where the customers have bought a generator, right? And they want to tie it to their system and, you know, they're, they're cheap. And then we design a transformer that can step it up to the level of the voltage or down. Any comments, guys? Any questions about these? So that's my generator, um, engine generator set, cooling the exhaust system, the... Um, the cooling system and the voltage. I have to give credit to this to Cummins. Um, this is the latest I got from, um, um, from actually, yeah, it used to be Cummins, but now from Kohler. Um, Jerry Boggs, you guys know Jerry Boggs? Probably comes here all the time. This is from Jerry Boggs. He gave the presentation to our students. These are the regulations. And that was as of last year, and I don't claim to be expert. When it comes to generators, if you install other than emergency generator, be very careful <laughs> because the regulation is coming in very, very, um, it's becoming very, very tough. And this is a yearly schedule. We're in 2013. And the numbers I'm looking at is these the, uh, polluters that comes out of the um, generator. So they have to meet certain polluters. So if you have an emergency system, my understanding from, uh, from Jerry and a bunch of other experts in the generator, you don't have a whole lot of problem. If you have a non-emergency generator, as for for this application, I believe legally acquired standby system qualify as an emergency system for this application. So if you have legally acquired standby system or emergency system, the re regulation will be the first one. If you have an emergency system, non-emergency, that will be your standby, which you put a couple of generators here just in case to back up your system, survivability of the whole building. Uh, so if you have a storm, you continue to produce uh, whatever you're producing. So that's your, your non-emergency. So, and these values here are the NOx, so-called the NOx values here and HC and CO and PM. These are all polluters that are making holes in the ozone that we're trying to reduce the, the emission. So they become very restrict to the point where you have to treat the, uh, your exhaust, the fumes coming out of your exhaust, and it becomes, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, it becomes very expensive. Anybody has any comments? So I threw this one just FYI. Um, there's a great presentation done by Jerry about, you know, but if, you, if you're doing, do you guys do any other, do you have any other generators other than emergency and legally required? Sure. Okay, so that's, there's a, then you're going to consult with a generator manufacturer and they'll help you a lot in terms of EBA regulations and a bunch of other things.
So you don't have, yeah, yeah, you don't have, um, that's diesel. So, or, you know, you have to, with natural gas, you can reduce uh, much, much easier. But I threw this one just FYI. Um, more information, I guess, you can contact Jerry. You can get uh, really very important. So that's about the EPA regulation requirement. Um, and you can see it goes by the size of the KW or the horsepower of your generators. The higher, the bigger, the more, the more strict in terms of the outcomes or the polluters that you have to, you have to adhere to. Okay, then we went into, so that's just a regulation, EPA, big deal. And I don't know if you guys lead the EPA requirement or the, the, or the mechanical engineers when you have generators or work together. When I worked at S, uh, Short Ed Hendrickson, the mechanical engineers usually lead the whole, we help them with the electrical part, but they lead the whole regulations. But I don't know if you want to specify them. We specify them, but in terms of regulations, EPA and requirement and exhaustion and all this good stuff. You know. To work with. Okay. Yeah. No, no, I'm meaning following up with the regulations, make sure that when you install the system, the manufacturer have adhered. I, and it's really, they're very nice. They work together all the time. I mean, they'll help. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and um, the the, more, the only thing I can think of to treat them, the diesel, especially these ones, to have a standby diesel right now, this is copying jerry box. It will cost you twice if it's a standby system. The generator becomes so expensive because you have to treat the, the exhaustion coming out of the diesel engine. It becomes... Um, uh, basically, it's very expensive, so customers will not do it. Can uh, can we go there? Ah, in emerging ah, in terms of regulations, ah. Oh, okay. Well, if it's an if you classify it as an, it's all about the authority of jurisdiction. If it classifies as an emergency, um, I don't know because it, you're doing you're using a dual use basically. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be interesting. Yeah, I would think that you could sneak it as an emergency generator because it's used for emergency generator, but it has enough enough uh, oomph to feed other things too. Mm -hmm. So I don't. I really don't know. I don't know uh, how the regulation will go. Anybody, when it when you have to you. Yeah. 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 That's a good one. Yeah. I I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a good question for the manufacturer of the generators, just because I'm sure they're going. Through. It's more stringent. Yeah. But these are these becomes an emergency. That's very clear emergency generator. Though. Yeah. They, yeah, but but they're all called essential system. You're feeding essential system. There's a life safety and uh, the critical and what's the third one and uh, yeah but the yeah that's that you can do in terms of design all what you have to do the code allows you to do to have one generator where you can take three feeders out of it from the same generator three feeders 
no over competition device though one feeder no over competition device ahead of it take it to a switch gear design one feeder can go to the emergency another feeder can go to the legally required standby system and a third feeder can go to the um, option a standby system as long as you don't have an over competition device ahead of the feeder if you want to put an over competition device ahead of the feeder then you have to have three circuit breakers on the generators and you take the feeders out of these or three disconnects fuse disconnectors so forth the question would be about the EPA requirement here. Yeah, didn't Existing, yeah. Absolutely. And the sheet that I gave you, that's from Kohler and from Jury Box, and he has tons of information about it. I, the same thing, I would contact Cummins or Kohler or Katz, whatever manufacturer you guys, when it comes to the regulation. They have the top of it because they want to sell their engines. Okay, we go back into the emergency generator, guys, or legally acquired standby generators. When we size them, as you all know, we size them based on two criteria. One is called the running load, and the other one is the uh, starting load. And so if you have your starting load for motors, is usually the lock rotor current. So I threw this. That's how you find the equivalent of your. Um, so if it's uh, code B from this table, which is NEC code book, you can find the equivalent um, of the starting capability of your motor. So when you side generator in the back of your mind, it should be two things. How many KW do I need to run simultaneously? And how many KWs or horsepower do I need to start simultaneously? Uh, based on if you want to start the whole building simultaneously, your generator will be bigger in size in KW um, because it has to have oomph to push together and start uh, everything together. So a good design would be is to split your system um, to, to, to minimize your size of your generator to split the starting of your equipment. So you can, by controlling your equipment, you can start them um, you know, you start the, for the most important thing, the emergency light panel, pick him up, and then you pick up everything else. And the way you can do that one, if you're paneling switch gear, it's easy. You can pick it up with the circuit breaker. If you have an auto transfer switch, you can pick it up with different auto transfer switches, or you can interface. I believe they allow you also to interface the control system. So if you have 20 pumps and you need to pick them up, you don't have to pick them up all at the same time. So what you can do is you can, with the control of these 20 pumps, you can uh, pick them one at a time. Every 10 seconds, one of them can come if it needs to, based on your control system. So you can build the start of these equipment uh, into your control scheme of these equipment. Am I making sense when you start them versus you run them? Yes, sir. Do you have to battery back up? That, that would be. Well, if you have, a, like, they're legally required standby stand pumps. If you're in an area where it could be flooded, the, they are really legally required standby pumps that you have to pick them up so you don't flood your basement and it becomes a hazard. You have to pick them up within 60 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. So what you do is with these 60 seconds, you can... Okay. 
of your module. Yeah. I would say you're probably at the most modern two or three steps. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I have a calculation that goes through that one, but the most important thing is the start and the motor. When you comes to motor, especially motors because of air rush, um, the best thing for bigger motors, if you are picking up the whole building, is to block them by the control. Make the air handling unit first. Air handling unit one will picks up ten seconds. Air handling unit two picks up ten seconds, three, and so forth as part of your control system. Um, or if you have um, electronic power circuit breakers, you can control them through the electronic circuit breakers. Okay, so that's uh, the UPS, the size, I don't know, uh, Tom, you remember the size used to be, if you have UPS, you have to double size of generator, right? Um, double the size of generators. The last time I heard is 1.5. So if, if you want to pick up a, a UPS, you have to throw 50% bigger than what, what the size of UPS. I mean, any? One to one. Okay, so between 150 to 200, basically, of the size. So, yeah. Okay. 1.5. So, that's when you have a UPS system, you have to be a little bit more conservative on terms of if you have a 100 kVA UPS system, you need to pick up do you need a 100 kVA generator or do you need a 150 kVA generator? Typically, when we have, uh, you know, you go in the that's when you talk to the manufacturer of the UPS, so you go by 50% more. Um, okay, so that's the sizing. This is the um, um, emergency generator, as well as legally required standby system. They have to have derangement signals. You guys have seen them all the time. Um, it's signal device, have, have both um, vo noise as well as visual, audible and visual. So outside the generator room, indicate malfunction in the generator. Um, the correction operation of the battery. So if you have low fuel, low heating, cooling, whatever, the battery ground fault has to be indicated here. So you and with if you have a ground fault in your system outside, you will see an alarm and a noise coming out of the generator, indicating that your emergency generator or or your legally required standby generator is having a problem. So go adhere to it. So you can imagine because these are emergency. The last thing you want to you want to have is an emergency generator that being called to start, and it has dead batteries that doesn't start the generator. Can you imagine how bad this would be? So that would be the outside outside you mount it outside the generator room. Any comments, guys, of the arrangement? You use it all the time um, to indicate the situation in terms of your emergency generator as well as legally required standby if you have an optional generator it's optional but typically we we do it anyway if you have, if you have enough money to put generators there might as well take advantage of all the capability of uh, of these generators as well as the survivability too so then we comes into installing the systems now when we install the systems um, we typically use transfer switches and equipment they're really a multiple ways of doing the cheapest way of having a generator is emergency generator and picks only the emergency loads as in exit signs and egress lights and one elevator maybe and maybe a, a pump, uh, some pump that qualified as an emergency or a fire pump. So that would be the cheapest, the cheapest way. There are multiple ways of doing it. This is probably would be the cheapest ways to go here and take a feeder from your main service. And to an auto transfer switch, you decide if you want to run this generator uh, four pole auto transfer switch or three pole as in separate drive system or non separate drive system. <coughs> so if you're running a separate drive system three pole, non separate drive, separate drive system four pole, non separate drive system three pole, as in switching the neutral. So that probably will be the cheapest. And then from here, you, you feed an emergency panel or a legally required standby panel. Um, so that's one option. The other option here is um, this will feed this. I don't know if you guys use this option. That's that would be if you have um, uh, you want to back up the whole building and you want to use the auto transfer switch as your service disconnect means. So you bring your service into the auto transfer switch. Then the code require you to have an off position. So your auto transfer switch, which a lot of them are. So the auto transfer switch right here acts as a service disconnect means an auto transfer switch at the same time. 
and then from here you go down into your um, your buildings, you load, you load, and you and and so forth. Have you guys designed anything like this landing yet? Into the so where you and then you bond the neutral to the ground right into the service disconnect means which is now the auto transfer switch that's backing up the whole building. Back. All of yeah, short, and then you bring a service and you land it in the over devices device inside the building. So up on the loss of power, um, then your all your building will be um, will be backed up. So that will be your generator to back up the whole building. Now, how would you qualify that one here? Is it an emergency generator when you back up the whole building? Legally required standby generator or not? <laughs> so if yeah, this yeah yeah. Um, so that's where this would be a good example if you have a critical operation power system that would be a good application where you back up the whole building to an auto transfer switch another option here is to have the, the inside the oh, where am i here inside the transfer switch they give you a compartment where you can put the surface disconnect means right inside it um, to feed your system so basically your disconnect is going to be part of the auto transfer switch Disconnects your service disconnect means the auto transfer switches, guys. Um, I'm sure you know that it comes in basically two technologies either contactors, where they're dumb, they're just like a contactor opening and closing them, or they can come as circuit breaker. The circuit, if you are using circuit breakers as auto transfer switches, then these are capable of using picking the over competition right for the system. So that would be an application where you have two circuit breakers sitting side by side acting as an auto transfer switch and at the same time they can be utilized as an over competition device for the utility as well as the um, as a generator. So these are a couple of options. Um, there is um, the auto transfer switch required on legal required and emergency system manual only you can only put manual on standby system if you decided to go so. Static transfer switch is the only th place I've seen them on uh, data centers. They use static transfer switches. These would electronically they switch the signal. Uh, you guys use them static and anything other than that static. It's, yeah. And the, the UPN data center. Absolutely. Yeah, so that static is not common. It's used with the UPS system. Very expensive to use. Did you? <laughs> static. And uh, with the auto transfer switches, there are two options. There is, um, you know, you can have uh, uh, open transition or closed transition. So they can give you open transition as you interrupt the flow power to the air, to the uh, to the building and then you connect to the generator that's your open transition you see clip in the system closed transition you connect the two systems together as in generators and uh, utilities close them and then together now they're both of them are looking at the load and then you drop the utility the difference between them is you wouldn't see a blip in the system so the light you wouldn't see the light uh, turning off so and either one of them will meet the requirement of the auto transfer switch Manual, of course, manual doesn't. Manual go physically, mechanically, you push the button. Any comments, guys, about the auto transfer switches, manuals, especially the auto and the manual? So these are a couple of examples. So I grabbed a couple of these guys. Um, this is Cutler Hammer. I like Cutler Hammer a little bit. You can probably uh, see it. So these are, when you go to Cutler Hammer, and a lot of them, guys, uh, by the way, the, this information, Color Hammer, but the picture is coming from ASCO, just for the record here. So there's two, the, the info is from Color Hammer, the picture from um, ASCO have nice pictures. So um, what they use is they use circuit breakers or contactors. So right here is this a technology where they use a contactor, two, two contactors to close and open to transfer the power. So they use the technology of contactor to open and close and transfer your power. Um, that's one technology. Um, the other technology is to use circuit breakers. So the bigger sizes, bigger auto transfer switches, they start using electronic circuit breakers. Electronic circuit breakers where they can, it's like pedaling, almost pedaling. You close and open these circuit breakers. Um, if it's closed transition, you close both of them to the two utilities momentarily, not forever though, or not pedaling, and then you drop the one that you want to drop. 
So these are two technologies again, soft load, they call it soft load transfer. If you're doing breakers, most likely you have closed transition. Closed transition. Any comments, guys? Any questions? All this information is about from Cutler Hammer, especially the one on the on this side here. These are the pictures I got from here. Is um, can't remember. It's Cutler Hammer or Asco. Any comments about the transfer switch with technologies? Contact smaller smaller auto transfer switch tend to be contactors. Bigger auto transfer switch tend to be circuit breaker technology. And they size them different enclosures. They're smart auto transfer switches, guys, very smart equipment. So they have, this is the controller, switch control that comes with them. They can sense uh, open transition, closed transition. Okay, you can see each one of these controls can decide, are you gonna go open, close? They can sense voltage frequency. They can they can do a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, you can pick a lot of information out of the controllers. Any comments, guys, any questions without getting into and I leave the details to the manufacturers of the switch gears. So I grabbed this one. This looks like a, a residential one, but it's I thought it's really nice picture of depicting how you feed an emergency panel, even though it looks like here it says 120, 240, but you can imagine this could be for any voltages that you can imagine. So here's picking up, this will be your emergency panel right in here and uh, we auto transfer switch double double pull double throw your auto transfer this is your auto transfer switch or manual transfer switch and in this case there are three depending upon the three system there have three uh, three pole and i'm bonding you bond the neutral if you have a three pole system right here so basically you switch phase a phase b phase c only the neutral will be bonded you have a non severed derived system if you have four pole we switch phase a phase b phase c and the neutral then you got yourself um if you switch the neutral you get yourself a separate derived system if you do not switch the neutral you get yourself a non separate derived system what's the difference is the difference is do we bond the neutral to the ground at the generator or we don't so and we talked about this when we did the grounding any comments guys i thought just some graphic of bringing a feeder into an auto transfer through manual and um, feeding a panel that feed your critical loads. So that's a couple of graphics. So what's in it for us? You know, you it's nice because we specify this system all the time. It's really nice to know that our, am I specifying three pole switch or four pole switch? My understanding, if your system, if if you have a, um, a separate drive system. Um, you will give you a three pole if it's separate, if it's a uh, non separate derived system, you got yourself three poles or cheaper equipment. But uh, what do you guys prefer? Do you prefer running separately and non separately? Um, I know in bigger system, when we have paralleling switch gear, you run non separate derived system, you tie the neutral all together so you can parallel the switch gears. But it's in smaller systems, as in you're transferring with mm -hmm. auto transfer switch, you really have the option. Yeah. Three pole. Yeah, you tie the neutral together. Um, I got a question. Yeah. Normally, on, on our transfer switches, we have a make or break system. That's closed transition. That's your pull transfer. Yeah, make before break. You or break before make. Oh, that's open transition. Yeah, open. That's normally how we. Yeah, a lot of if you have closed transition, then the utility is uh, force you to have relaying because of feedback and so forth. There's a lot of requirement that becomes more expensive. Yeah, yeah. Basically, have to meet all the requirements parallel. Yeah. Yes, and remember, 99% of the generators that we specify are emergency power building, and they don't switch it just. Yeah. Out, so there's nothing, there's no point to go to yeah. yeah, and they allow you. Yeah. Yeah. And since emergency system can be out for 10 seconds based on the code, so they really don't. You can go open transition for cheaper equipment. So. Cheaper equipment. So there's open transition, closed transition, and soft start. Go soft, soft start and paralleling. It it goes the the next level. 
but closed transition, they give you, my understanding is a little, you still have to have relaying system, but because you're closing momentarily only and breaking, unlike soft start where you close forever and pick load from this to this, so it's cheaper, but still much, a lot expensive than open transition. What would they do is either you have a, a bank or resistor bank where you can throw or throw the, the load into these generator and test them. We don't interrupt the power. Um, so that's what they do, I believe, in hospitals. You don't want to mess around with the hospital. So they have a, another source, another load where they can test their generators. They can even, even put reactor to simulate um, uh, inductive reactants too, reactors and, and resistors. Yeah. So they load them other than the hospital. Load banks, yep, load banks. Absolutely. <laughs> Specify load banks. Yeah, bypass isolation is for maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. Fewer. Yeah. Yeah. You have, if you have an emergency auto transfer switch, I always say it's always nicer to have a bypass. So you can take all your electronic, electronic will fail at one time, but you don't have to though. By code, you don't have to have an, a bypass. They get bigger with a bypass, yeah. yeah. Then, you, then you go by the basic the minimum, which is a transfer switch that if it fails, it fails, you know, so. But I, yeah. And then as far as the bike has, the bike has the field required. The bike has what basically doubles the space, doubles the cost. It's enough to switch in parallel between the switch. It's not going to switch. Well, you manually can override it. Yep. So this is um, just a graphic here of bike partial building where exactly like you you come from the generator where you, you disconnect here and you feed an auto transfer switch that feed your emergency system. In this case, um, that, that was actually not emergency, that was for the UPS, you throw a UPS on it here, uh, UPS system. The other one is um, when you have better link switch gear, that's a soft start where you bring your generators directly to the bus and you energize the bus, you parallel the two circuit breakers together, and then you drop the utilities. If the utilities is there, it's if you're peak, uh, peak shaving, or if the utilities is out, you um, you basically start to generate or pick up the load. When the utility comes back, synchronize with the utility, transfer the load softly to the utility and get off. So I don't know how much of these are we doing with the regulation APA, like we did a lot of in the past for data centers. Um, yeah, for data centers. Most yeah. yeah. switch here. And then this is then you get into you know the bringing all your generators directly into the switch gear, draw out switch gear. 
um, with electronic circuit breakers, we can utilize this capability of these generators. <clears throat> okay, any comments, guys? Any questions about generators? That's, I thought that. Some yep. cases, if I remember with the last thing on my time, the EPA even speaks on where you have to run that stamp for the generator. I, yeah. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. I'm not surprised. I mean, there's a lot of regulations. Uh, I'm not familiar with the details of the stack and all this good stuff, but there's it gets involved. The, um, the generators that we did medium voltage, when I worked on the medium voltage, we have mechanical engineers that get involved into all the the mechanical part of it, and we specify the electrical part of it. But right, I don't think that's EPA law. That's a mechanical design that's required in order to get proper uh, Suction of the air is back the the Okay, can I guys pull you <laughs> for a second? What I did is, I don't know if you use Commons Power Suite. Do you guys use it when you size generators? Or yeah. yeah. So this is Power Commons Suite. That's how we typically size your generators. And I'm sure you guys have seen it. Your um, here's your load. It's very simple to use. The first thing you need to decide how many steps you want to start. And step means um, basically up to five to ten seconds delay on the load that you're going to pick. In this case, there are nine steps. This project is for a draw out switch gear. So every circuit breaker in a draw out switch gear can be considered a, a step because you can ch uh, close that circuit breaker at any time you want. There's a lot of control into it. So nine circuit breakers draw out switch gear typical on a, on a, this is a, this is for a 4000 amp switch gear system layout. So the a step is five to ten seconds, basically starting a load, and then um, then you assign all your loads here. So here's my emergency load. I have um, I have close to ten kVA, and that's when you get into your load calculation. How much load is my my emergency lighting panel is going to be? So I want to pick it on step number one, um, and then you go to the UPS load, and then my lighting panel, and receptacle panel, and then have um, a couple of pumps here, chiller. Uh, bus duct 480 and 208, bus duct 208 is going to go through a transformer, of course. And you pick all your loads all the way to the exhaust fans, each one of these loads. And then you assign the loads into steps. So I put my step number one is emergency panel. I want to pick it up because that's my emergency load. And then you get into the um, um, my UPS. I want to pick up my UPS load because it's important to me after four words. And then you start putting my lighting panel and so forth. After your emergency panel, it's your choice what you want to pick, really. Typically, if you have a legally required standby system, you pick it up. And then you pick anything else. So light is a good example to pick. So that's how you put your loads. And then... Um, so, and the, the, the reports that I gave to you guys is basically coming out of this. You can see that report is, um, if you look at, let me just go here uh, directly into my view uh, step. So if you look at the steps, these are all the steps that you do every step and how many uh, loads on it. Here's my step number one, and it will tell you two things, the running load and uh, at one point, my running and starting KW, I have 4.8 running, uh, 4.8 starting. 
So each one step it assign a running load and a starting load based on the type of the load. Motors typically it's going to be much, much bigger to to start. So I thought um, let me just go to a couple of step number six. What does it have? Um, air handling unit. So if you look at step number six here in the load, I have an air handling unit. Um, running KW is 10.7. Starting. KW is 10.7, and the reason for this because we are putting a VFD on the on the air handling unit. So if you put a VFD is on your equipment, you can soft start these equipment so they don't the generator will not see the big impact um, of the starting current of the generator. So, and the software allows you to assign a VFD. When you put a VFD, it cuts down into your starting capability of your system. Very, very important. It, long story short, what's in it for it? It gets smaller generator. You always get a smaller generator. So that's um. So when you get into you get into all the loads and the type of loads. Uh, if you see um, a motor, an exhaust fan. Look at this one. They have an exhaust fan here. Exhaust fan two. Running load is 4.4. And starting uh, load is 22.9. You can see because it's running at a contactor, big, six times more or so. So that's your load report. I don't know if you guys run a load report. You typically run the load report to give you every single step and how it's assigned to the load. What I've done in the past is I, I send this one to a smarter than me, typically the generators, manufacturers. Say, so here's what we've done. Guess you can review that one and make sure we're not missing anything. Um, so that's your loads. And then, um, then the second report that you do, um, if I close this one here, um, and I believe the second report is going to be, you have to run the study first, and then um, report, report view, recommended generator report. And that will get you, uh, this generator is a 250KW, and I don't know if you guys can see right here, it, there are two of them, I'm paralleling two sets, two generators, that will get you into the software, allow you to parallel multiple sets when you run your generator, so that I'm running two generators, 250KW each. Um, to pick up um, a 4,000 amp switch gear load, something like 4,000 amp. Um, and these are 48277, 48277. So, so that will give you all the, look at this running KW and running KVA and starting um, the maximum step on each one of these generators. So it, it summarizes all the loads on it right here. Um, it gives some set specification here for set performance and the dip and so forth and, and alternator and, and what's not. Um, so that's the most important thing out of this report really is you're going to get the, the from from uh, Cummins, the size of 250 DFLC generator. Right now, I believe Cummins have this calculator online. I don't know if you guys use the online uh, version of it. We can go plug all your loads and get you the actual size of the gen that you want, want for this building. Really nice to, to play with it. And like I said, they size it based on two things, running load, and based on the type of the load, they assign a starting load. The running load is not an issue. The starting load is assigned based on what type. If it's motor, typically six times the K KW or the horsepower of that motor, um, and so forth. Did they say 250? Yeah. I'm sorry, 1250. <laughs> I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. Sound like for 4,000 AM. No, I apologize. 1250, yeah, 1,250 KW. These are 1,250 KW. That's a big boy. So two of them will cover a 4,000 amp switch here. So the, you guys ran these before, right? This report or something similar. Do you use CAT? I've never used CATs. I think they have one like this, don't they? They should. Kohler have a software like this. So it's really nice. I thought just to throw it, it's nice um, nice to do it. I'm going to go directly into an air handling engine and sw switch for the sake of the time. You click here. Here's where you. I have a, a 25 horsepower air handling unit um, on the right side. The right side of the air handling unit. There's a, a fan, and it's a 25 horsepower, 480. And look at the. I'm assigning a VFD. That's why when you guys saw the starting capability, look at this. The running KW is 20.72, and the starting KW is 20.72 because I have a soft start. The VFD will give me a soft start of these equipment. So it becomes really good when you pick up this, the design here. Um, you have uh, uh, the pulse width modulation. Um, if you unclick this one, then it gives you the standard NEMA size. Look at the difference. Can you just see the difference? 
see substantially different in terms of sizing it. It went from 21 into 65 almost, just by clicking to a standard NEMA across the line where there's no reduction in voltage or whatsoever. I always pay attention to this a lot. Um, high efficiency motor, it, it went even higher than that. So, <laughs> So it's really, I don't know if they, these are the options that you you have. I think they should be able to give you options. Then you go VFDs and it reduce it down. Starting is not an issue. So that's another advantage of having a VFD or soft start in the motor like we did before. Okay, so I thought just to give you this one, any comments guys about this software? Just overview quick. I wanna go directly and then we'll close the chapter of motors. We go to um, um, generators, I'm gonna go to the curve now now we size the generator now we're going to go run um, um, ASCII AM PTW over current protection coordinator for a generator so what I, the same gen guys that we did this graph here so what I did is I don't know if you see the one line diagram here here's my one line diagram you guys this one line diagram is there uh, let me show you the the package that I gave first here's the system that I decided to use and these are all hypothetical systems um, I, I brought, this is a bigger system, I brought three generators, 1250 each, and paralleled them across a switch gear and pulled the power out of that switch gear into a different switch gear to feed multiple systems. You see how they group together? So what I'm going to do is coordinate the feeder for the switch gear that's coming out of the three generators with the uh, circuit breaker that's tied inside the switch gear to generator one, all of them identical, with the generator curve. Right, everybody can see what we're doing. So I took only one of them because the other two are identical. So it doesn't really do me any any good to do them. So if you come over here and you go to your gen, um, no changes, you come over here. Okay, here's what, uh, here's my one line diagram. Like you can see, I have my generator. I have my overcompetition device for the gen, the cable, as well as the overcompetition device for the feeder that's going down to feed the switch gear. So the most important thing, and please help me here, is the curve, the coordination between the overcompetition device for the generator, as well as the star, as well as the curve of the generator. Can you guys see that curve of the generator? This is the curve of the generator, and what 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 they want you to do, the, your overcompetition device should be able to handle the full load current of the generator. You can see it's hugging the full load current right in here, goes all the way down. And it should hug that the that, that, um, generator curve all the way down. At this point here, they recommend that you cross that generator exactly like it's shown here. Um, and it goes to the left of the generator curve. This area, my understanding, is that what allows you to start starting capability of a generator. When you start your gen, that's how much current your gen is going to see. Right here, that's for, and I, can you guys see it? This is only for... 0.1 of a second we're talking about 0.1 of a second your generator is going to see substantial almost total dc and ac here i can't remember it's like uh, almost 20,000 amps when you start your generator your gen is going to see um at the start point now remember this generator the full load amp of this gen is a big boy uh what was the full load uh, this one is 1879 so it's almost 2000 amp generator that's a big generator full load now, when you start the boy, if you have um, an AC only, you're going to have uh, almost 11,000 amps. And if you combine the DC and the AC, com combination will give you a 19, almost 20 amps. So what they recommend is, is your circuit breaker to be as close as possible to the combination. Right at the point of point one cuts right here. And it, then it goes and it tries to hug this generator to the right all the way up. That will give you the best protection for your generator. It allows your gen to start, pick up the load, get the oomph when you start that load, starting oomph on it. And at the same time, if your generator is not to start or to short, your circuit breaker will be able to trip fast enough to protect your generator. Does that make sense? That generator here? Um, now that's the first curve. And then the second curve, of course, that's the feeder. Can you guys see on a feeder, that's my main feeder. I have a 4,000 amp feeder. You can see here. I use color hammer magnum. Do you guys use magnum a lot? Magnum when 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 draw out circuit breakers, the, very common. A 4,000 amp coordinating with a circuit breaker for. Um, I'm sitting this one at, if you can see, at 95 percent of 2,000, which give me 9900 9, amp. Yeah, uh, 9, 9, uh, 1900 amps. 1,900 amps. 1,900 amps. Yeah, 1,900 amps. 
any comments any questions if you're um how many of you guys use skm okay if you use skm um skm on the website have you guys seen the recommendation for coordinating generators if you have not seen the files that they have there they have like 24 files how to coordinate for a motor how to coordinate for a generator how to coordinate for a capacitor if you have not seen these go there really nice they're like two or three pages each and it it tells you exactly what i'm saying here the recommendation right on their website yeah thank you there's the short circuit rating of the generator right here you can Yeah, but but so this is for one generator. So um, here's your yeah, that will be assigned. This short circuit is assigned for this particular generator, and your circuit breaker you can see have to be to the left of this point, this short circuit point, the sub transient X um, that they, they call it. So that point when you coordinate, you have your black this uh, the 18 the 1900 amp have to be to the left of this short circuit to the right of that curve so yep thank you the short circuit point is very very important too. any comments guys about these so that's um that's basically oh another thing that you have to pay attention of course not a whole lot of deal you have to coordinate with the damage curve of your conductors you can see this is the damage curve of my conductor um, I'm pulling, let me see how much, how many of these I'm pulling. I'm pulling uh, 500 kcm, five sets of 500 kcm to pick uh, 2150 amp, 2150, uh, five sets. And see that my, gen my uh, right, that will tell you is my damage curve, my circuit breaker will protect the conductors from a damage, from, the, from being burned. So what you need to do with this curve here, if you have not come here with the coordination, have to be to the left of the damage curve. All these guys in the SKM, I apologize if you haven't used SKM, probably it's not, uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot to you. So I thought just to throw that one as coordination when it comes to motors, because that's one thing you have to pay attention when we when we do the motors. And anything downstream from the motor have to be coordinated right here. So if you have a feeders that fed downstream from this, the not motor, from this generator have to be, um, to be right down here. Any comments guys, any questions? So that's um, that's my generator. Um, I think that's all what I have for in terms of generators. Any comments, guys, about generators before I switch to a, a little bit of a topic? Yeah, comment, uh, yeah. If you go like an SK power tools and you find this really nice circuit breaker that you can coordinate so easily with your generator, you just have to be careful because that not even yes is probably an eight thousand dollar circuit breaker. You're absolutely right. Um, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I used a bigger generator. Now, if you have a 500 kW generator and you have a molded case circuit breaker um, and you're going to use a thermal, a thermal magnetic circuit breakers, you've got to be very careful when you coordinate with these. Yep, absolutely. So, um, should have thrown one of these too. But it's, uh, you, you might have to change the, the type of the, the circuit breaker. If you have an adjustable circuit breaker, even if it's molded case, adjust instantaneous adjustable circuit breaker, even molded case circuit breakers, you could really good coordination with them. As long as you have that, the instantaneous is adjustable. But if you have a fixed circuit breaker, which is typically up to what, 200 amp, 225, you go higher than 300 amp, you almost always want to be at least adjustable instantaneous because it, it helps you with the motors, it helps you with a lot. Adjustable instantaneous is a big deal. Thank you. It, it's not as easy as, as if, you, if your circuit breaker is fixed, if the coordination could be misleading. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, any comments, guys, before we move into, I have some time here to talk about capacitors. Any comments about generators? Any corrections, Dave, anybody? So I thought just to talk about the emergency system, legally required, standby, mix them all up together with generators. Um, yeah, before I do that, when I have a calculation sheet, that's what I was, I, I knew I was missing something. There's a calc sheet I would like you guys to look at for generators. Where is it? Right here. Okay, so here's, I did calc two calculation for the generators, and I would like you guys to look at it. I have the same system that you're looking at. Now, remember that 1250 KW that we size, this should look like the, uh, worksheet 11, says generator calculation three phase. Way at the end, I think, um, so there's three of them, one of them should be 
should say um, WS011 worksheet 11 and generator calculation. Okay, so I have three generators. All of them are 480, 1250, one of them is 1250, one is 11, and the other one is 230. Typically, you wouldn't do something like this, but it could. You typically, if you're paralleling generators, we like to see them all the same size. So, but you could have, I put three different loads just for the sizing purposes. And I picked one little boy, 230, because if it's a little guy, when we do calculation, it's slightly different. So, the first thing I would do, uh, and these are the system, the one-line diagram for him, because we're engineers, we don't do anything without one-line diagram, right? So, that's exactly the one that I did coordination for. Um, okay, the first thing you need to do is convert it into KVA. At least, Cutler, at least um, comments the assumption when you get a KW, a generator is a worst power factor, which is 0.8. So that's your worst scenario power factor is 0.8. So that's where you calculate based on it. Some calculation is based on 9. So your worst case, you can see I'm dividing the KW by 0.8. That's my worst case power factor, running power factor, not starting. And that will give me the KVA. The reason why I did this one, because I need the full load amp of this generator. So here's my full load amp of generator 1. Can you guys see that? Generator 2 and generator 3. All of them, I'm finding the full load amp. Because when I size cables and when I size over protection device, I size them based on what? Amps. So, but everybody knows why 0 0.8. If you know your generator is 0.9, you can stick a 0.9 there. And then it gets you less KW. Uh, KVA. Okay, then generator feeder. Here's how I did the generator feeder. Um, now, I want to I want to take you guys into, this is really interesting one right here for sizing. If you go to 215.2A1, if you go to 215.2A1 from NEC codebook, it tells you a very, very important concept. It says when you size feeders, based on continuous load, you multiply them by 1.25, right? Right underneath it, there's an exception. I don't know how many of you guys have paid attention to the exception. It says, if your generator, um, if the cables are tied to an 100% rated circuit breaker assembly, as in a drought switch here, look at the condition, the exception. If they're tied to 100% rated assembly, um, a circuit breaker inside an assembly rated for it, you can size your circuit breaker and your feeders to the full load amps, no 1.25 is needed. The, this rule, we use it all the time, or I use it all the time when we have sw a drought switch gear. Easy, because it's 100% rated assembly, meaning if you have a 4,000 amp, theoretically, or the manufacturer is telling us, you can pull a, a 4,000 amp out of it continuously for more than four hours. So, based on this, and I, that's a big assumption, I, here's the full load amp of my generator. I went to the next standard adjustable circuit breaker. And I emphasize the word adjustable. At these amps, guys, you must have an adjustable circuit breaker. Look at the amps. So my next adjustable circuit breaker is 900, 1900. How would I know that? That's from SKM. <laughs> so, of course, there is no 1900 amp circuit breaker if you go to 240.6. Now, at that, if you go higher than 1000, you're dealing with adjustable circuit breaker. You better look at the manufacturers and see how. And typically, guys, they rate them, you know, 0.1, 0.2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 2 point, 1 .0 from that rating, the plug. So, and then I size my cable directly to the circuit breaker. So I size my cable to the next standard uh, circuit breaker is 19, adjustable 1900. And that's where I got it right here too. See, that? here's my circuit breaker right here, 900. And I size my cable to match it. Based on the rule that says if it's an assembly, even if it's continuous, all what you have to do is um, size the overcome protection device and the feeders to match the loop, continuous or non-continuous, no 1.25. Okay, so then you get into the second one, the same thing. The third one here, the baby one, that's what I want to emphasize. That baby guy, high, highly unlikely that you're going to have an adjustable uh, and 100% rated assembly on a baby 230KW generator. These are probably molded case circuit breakers. You can have adjustable, but they're not rated 100% typically. So what I usually do, I assume the worst scenario, which is continuous load, their feeder, what's a continuous load? You multiply by 1.25, you got yourself 440, and then you go to the next standard um, non-adjustable circuit breaker at, at the smaller generator, non-adjustable circuit breaker, 450, and size my feeders to match it. Do you guys do it differently? I'm just curious. You do it differently. On a smaller one, 1.25 is a good idea because they're non-adjustable. 
um, um, they, and they are not 100% assembly, but I saw so I threw one baby one, 230, and the other one are the bigger ones with 100% rated assembly, where you size directly to the load. And then the... You got... Yeah, uh, yeah. If you specify a hundred rate, a fully rated circuit breaker and rated in an assembly rated for it, the assembly tool, then you can go directly based on the load right here. So three hundred forty-seven, you can literally put a four hundred amp circuit breaker on it. So, and by the way, can you put a four hundred amp circuit breaker? Yes, you can, because the code says you can go higher, but you always can go lower on circuit breaker. You can put a fifty amp circuit breaker on that one, but it might trip all the time you start mm -hmm. so i mean that's um so that's how i do it and then um i, I put then the rest of it sizing the equipment ground conductor that's based on the uh, circuit breaker then i have an emt conduit and flexible metallic conduit exactly like i did for everything else guys sizing for you okay the, so that really the most important thing is here right underneath it generator I want to go directly into the system. Now I have to size that system boy here. See that circuit breaker for the whole system. What I usually do personally is I add the full load amp of all of them. Add the full load amp, all of them. This is what I came up with. My next adjustable circuit breaker as, um, as for, I, I put 400 amp. I could have probably gone to 3,900 amp, but you need, uh, you need a frame of 4,000 anyway. So I size my system for 4,000 amp directly based on the full load amp of these equipments. At that level, guys, um, <laughs> so you t you don't have to multiply by 1.25, my point. So I got a 4,000 amp, then I size my conductors based on the 4,000 amp, here's what I came up with here. I size my, look at the equipment grinding conductor, weird. Look at the size of the equipment grinding conductor here, 500 kW, because you're sizing based on the 400 amp, that's if you, so, <laughs> Your equipment grounding conductor coming from the um, circuit breaker into your switch gear is going to be a 500 K kW. If the circuit breaker is located on the switch on on the, on the generator, and then you size the conduit that's bringing that power from the system all the way back to the building. Any comments, guys? 500 KCM. You said 500 KCM. Yeah, 500 KCM. Yeah, thank you. KW. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, 500 KCM. Any comments, guys? Any questions about that? So, I know you. There's, you know, at that level, guys, we're in, we're engineers. We we can kind of play with the numbers a little bit. I could have lowered this into see this one here. I could have adjusted to nine 3900 amps and sized my conductor to 3900 amps. But at that level, I uh, take full advantage of a plug that rated for 4,000 amp, but my switch gear is 4,000 amp, so it's easier to continue with the 4,000 amp. So there's a few rules here. Any comments, guys, about this? So too much, too little? The square power pack, which I think is the equivalent of, I think, yes, the first set point is the .9, so you can't give the .9. Okay. You can't dial the dial to anything. Less, more than uh, 0.9 of this. So if you want a 3900, it's a larger number than 0.9. So yeah. you're going to squeeze back and put it on there. Yeah. But that, and SDF power tools are supposed to know that. I found that and I called this for a reason. I, like I said, why, can I, why is power tools? Allow me. It's made of 0.9 because that's all you can do on that breaker. You know, 0.9 and then it gets, then it goes to like, you know, because there's only like 16 indentations on yeah. it. Little set, yeah. uh, you know whatever yeah. it's called. Yeah, mm -hmm. adjustable. So it's not that good. There's not some of them. Yeah. They're not intimately adjustable. They have specific numbers you can get. So it's, then they'll have. So here's a here's the four thousand amp. Here's the adjustment here that that a magnum will give you from point four all the way to one in these increments.
So the bin's up on the circuit breaker. Yeah. Yeah. So four. Uh, that will give me if I go there. What would? Oh, they're gonna be thirty-eight hundred. Isn't that thirty-eight? Yeah. So you almost have to go to. You're absolutely right. You almost have to go to. Yeah. You can't go to four dollars. Yeah. I thought, you know, once you got to this level. Oh, that's a four that's a twelve thousand dollar circuit breaker. I thought I could have thirty nine hundred and eighty three amps if I wanted in my setting, but you can't you can't. You're that one at that point I thought the first setting down. Doesn't give you. Yeah. 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 And I just thought I had that with Jerry who's uh yeah. When when we deal with a breaker at that level, it's always nice to know what the manufacturer are, what the options are. Cutler Hammer, I'm familiar with them, Square D and GE, all of them, they have all their adjustable circuit breakers. They have the settings that you can adjust them. So you can really, if you know with who manufacturer is, you can go to SKM and get the exact adjustment for the most part. Right, and then you can, the power pack line, you can both find a different circuit for that same breaker. And you Yeah. What my experience is almost every every reputable reputable manufacturer have a circuit breaker that you can coordinate with. Almost. Um, all what you have to do when you get to that level, you might have to ask for a, t a certain type of circuit breaker to be installed if if it doesn't coordinate. You all, they all have circuit breakers. A lot of them. Yeah. The Square D Master Pack used to have all that, and then discontinued it, went to the Power Pack, which is way more expensive. Yeah. Okay, I have 20 minutes to go over Power Factor. <laughs> Good discussion, Godais. We should have. For Power Factor, guys, it's a big deal. You get, um, being engineers and designers, they call us sometimes to correct the Power Factor in the building. Um, Power factor, as you know, the most important thing about power factor, if you have a lower power factor, you get penalized. If it's less than 90%, you get penalized by utilities. That's how we have to increase the power factor. So cosine of the angle, it goes from resistive to inductive. Uh, I put zero here, which is really a question mark on it, all the way to one. When you calculate it, power factor, you take the true power, which is the KW, the one that actually do the work for you, divided by the KVA, they call it apparent power. AP is apparent power. And... Um, and the angle, the angle between, without getting too technical, the angle between the voltage and the current on every phase will decide the power factor. So if the if the current and the voltage start and end at the same point, doesn't matter, doesn't matter doesn't matter what the magnitude is, you have 100 percent power factor. If they shift it together, you have a different power factor. So that's kind of the theory behind it. Um, a few things. Power factor correction, there you have two options. Most of you guys have digital meters right now. Customers in bigger project, they specify digital meters. Almost every reputable digital meter have a capability of measuring the power factor. Because all what you need to do is just measure the current and the voltage and uh, KW, and you can manipulate it internally, electronically to get you the power factor. So you can have either power factor meter, or you can have the old ones, they used to have a KVAR and KW, and by having the KVAR and the KW, you can calculate the, um, the power factor, or you can have a kilowatt meter and an amp and a volt meter together, and you can do the math. Um, but typically, these day, day and age, the manufacturers of uh, digital meters will get you the power factor right there. So any comments, guys, about the measurement of the power factor? 
So if you have a power factor, now that's correcting an existing problem, but um, I'm sure you guys have this sheet. This is one of the most important sheets that I've, I've discovered. I know you guys probably color hammer manual online has it if you want a bigger version of it. This will tell you the multi, you know, in, in, instead of doing the math like all days that we used to do it in college and find the KW of blah, 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 and then you find the power factor. All what you have to do is know what the KW of your power system, multiply it by, um, multiply it by the factor coming. So if I, this is, how many of you guys have seen this? Raise your hand. You've seen it before. Okay. So if you take, um, for example, my power factor here, let's just say, um, uh, let's take a power factor of 75 that's my original power factor when you correct you typically correct in the 90s so i'm going to go correct you don't go all the way high here you don't go higher because if you go to 97 and you are taking a chance of going leading power factor which creates a higher voltage in your system which also has a problem so i'm going to go correct from 79 to 92 the my f factor um, and f stands for fun here is uh, 0.456 so you take that number here right my right here yep 0.456 you multiply it by the kw in your building and you get yourself the size of the capacitor that you need easier said than done because the load fluctuates all the time right it changes from day to day from um from month to month from season to season so um you typically you get the worst scenario and you correct at like 92 and if you have lower than that you might go all the way to 96 97 power factor but you don't go in the leading side so that's how you use this this sheet. Any comments, guys? But you need to know what the KW of your power at the utility side, right? At the main service disconnect means or main service equipment, right? That's where you throw the capacitor right there. Typically, we, my understanding is what we do. This one is an existing building. They walk in, come to us as an engineer, say we have a problem with the power factor. Okay, so then we do a couple of measurements, take the worst scenario case in their building, get the KW from them, and we size the capacitor and we go through that capacitor. Be conservative though, go into the lower 90s, because when the building is lightly loaded, it shifts to the other side, unless you have an adjustable capacitor where you can sense the voltage like utilities do, which they have them, it sense what the power factor and turn things on and off. Basically, it's, it's um, dynamic, it senses what your power factor and, and add or reduce from this back of capacitors. But the cheapest way is just a box right by the switch gear, tie it to your system, up your power factor to say 92, when it's slightly loaded, the shift to 97 or maybe 100, but it doesn't shift to the other side into the leading part. Any comments about these, the KW? That's, that's correcting at the level of the switch gear, the cheapest, easiest way of correcting your power factor. Now, um, I do have a couple of um, these capacitor sizes, of course, from um, Color Hammer, and they have a couple of, all of them are KVARs, so again, these are manufactured of different, this is a 480 system, um, and this is what, what you probably most likely would be correcting. These are 600 volt, so you can see the sizes that they go through and the rated amps for each one of them, um, but I, I got them, so for you have a capacitor, this uh, value, you get your 35 KVAR at 42 amps at 480. So that will get you the amps, the voltage, and the KVAR. Capacitors are measured in KVAR. These are actual color hammer equipment. Any comments, guys, about these? So you can go there. Basically, when you get your KVAR, go find yourself a capacitor from color hammer or anybody else. Um, here's a couple of things how to correct the power factor. This is an example where I have a, a 74 percent power factor without capacitor. When you add your capacitor bank, you can up it up to 97. I want to bring your attention, guys, into the diagram. They have uh, 796. It stays the same, 796. That's the actual power. The true power never changes. Um, I have a 720 uh, KVAR here, and I added to it, the difference is I added another 200 KVAR capacitor. Yeah. Can you guys see what happened here? I added a capacitor bank of 200 KVAR to an already existing 720 KVAR. And that's how I reduced the uh, power, the appearance, so-called appearant power into uh, 821 from uh, 1,075 KVA. So by adding capacitor, um, by adding a capacitor, uh, a capacitor bank, capacitor are rated in KVAR, Capacitive, capacitive KVAR, the system always, almost always have an inductive KVAR, and these are like 
day and night, positive and negative, when they when they join together, they neutralize each other. So if they're equal, you get zero. If they're not equal, you get the difference between the two, right? Everybody understand? My assumption is you guys are familiar with that one. And then you get and you stick that capacitor. Basically, here's my 200K bar, and I stuck my 200K bar right into here, right? With a circuit breaker coming out of the switch here with a little bank box with a conduit and a wire, and you tie it to your capacitor bank. Did you add 200 or you added 200? I added 200. But when you, when you take the 200 out of the 750, what do you get? 520. That's the after you because these guys like the opposite direction they work. So the 200 k bar that you added to the system they are in the opposite direction of the 720. So when they meet, the leftover will be what what the system is going to see, which is seven. Um, in this case, 720. The difference between 720 and 200 it will be the 520. So when you add them, really you add them in the opposite direction. Any comments, guys, about these? So that's uh, the concept behind it. Do you guys have you guys used synchronous motors? Synchronous motors. What they do, I haven't done them. You can correct the power factor in two ways. You can either overexcite a synchronous machine, unloaded, overexcited synchronous machines, and you run it. It's basically a motor running there without an electrical or mechanical load on it. You don't tie anything electrically out of it, or you can don't tie anything on the rot rotor. It's just unloaded, unloaded synchronous machine. You overexcite it, so that's why I picked that system from Bobo. <laughs> You basically increase the excitation for the synchronous machine here. By overexciting, you start spitting more KVRs into the system. It acts exactly like a capacitor. They typically, my understanding is they use them in a manufacturing um, um, environment where you have multiple motors. You add another tiny little motor, synchronous one though, um, run overexcited, meaning adding more voltage into the windings and start pumping KVRs into your system. Um, and you size it to pump certain KVARs, and that, that's how you reduce it. Okay, this is how, uh, so I have a 700 KVAR, as they call them, synchronous condensers, they call them. Five, um, 520 KVAR here, I am adding it to um, 520 KVAR lead, my leading, and I'm adding it to, uh, where's my KVAR here, 720. I'm adding it to the 720, and when they, you're right, I added 520 KVAR, I should have listened to you. I'm adding 520 KVAR to 720, um, and then when we reduce them, when they add these two together in the opposite direction, of course, they're added, they reduce each other to 200. So we are adding the it's a 7, 520. Um, when you add these, that's the size of my capacitor. Add them up. The leftover will be the 200 kW. You're absolutely right. And then with the existing K -W, uh, 200 KVAR, with the existing um, 796 kW, it will get you um, an 821 um, KVAR, which means it will look at, that's my, my favorite. Look at the reduction in the amps. Look what, my amps were 1293 here. By the time you added the capacitor, my amps got knocked down by close to what, 200? 200 amps, knocked it down. So that's the concept of increasing the power factor by reducing the line current, which means you tell this love you now, because you are paying, for what you're consuming instead of consuming more when when what you're paying for any comments guys any questions about adding capacitors so first you go size it from that shard you add it by adding it it reduced the inductive reactance knock down your inductive reactance to the value the, of the capacitive reactance that you added okay so here's a couple of examples of of, of correction um, the poor man's way of correcting, these are from color hammer, is right at the service. And then the, that's the poor man. The rich man way of correcting is right at the load. They call them the offenders. Motors are offender, induction motors, not synchronous, are offender number one. So when we go, typically, if you have a 30 horsepower motor running, you go add a capacitor right next to that motor that offset the key bar of that motor while that motor is running. So every motor will be, if you have an MCC, you have a, an MCC there, right on top of an MCC, multiple, multiple um, um, capacitors with motors. That's the best way of doing it. That's what we do as engineers because we get involved right at the level of design. There are two ways of doing it. The best way, obviously, is to go tie your capacitor to that load side of the overload um, 
so protection so that when your motor is running, when your motor is running, your capacitor is running as well. It offsets it right at the level of the offender. That's the best way of doing it. The other way is also to go tie it to the load side of a disconnect right in here. You can see where the, the they're tying it. Um, you can put a controller on it where it start only starts when the motor is running. So you can control that one here, put a controller on it. So when that motor starts, the capacitor starts. When the motor is not starting, the capacitor will not start. So they, these are where we get involved in sizing a capacitor to solve the problem power factor right at the offender level, the rich man's way. Any comments, guys, about these comments? about calculating it okay have 15 minutes to move through that um so a couple of things guys from any code book about sizing now we're going to size the capacitor i have two examples for you sizing when now we know how to size a capacitor either you size it at the offender level the motor or at the system level the cheapest the poor man's way um or the aftermath afterwards way when you size your brand circuit the code says you have to multiply it by 135 um instead of 125 Brand circuit 135. When you size your disconnect, you always also have to have a disconnect for it. You also have to size the disconnect base 1.25. When you size the overload, it says as low as practical. Anybody have it says as low as practical. I typically multiply by 135 and go down if it's not a standard. If you look at the literature that Cutler Hammer has, they actually go higher than what what this is requirement. Either you go by the Requirement as low as practical, what the manufacturer is telling you to put, you put it there. Or if you don't know what the manufacturer say, sizing it 135% and dropping down on the size, because if it's not standard, these are typically non-adjustable circuit breaker they use for them, you drop down. That's how I typically, I do it. So that's sizing, that's where we get involved. Sizing the capacitor and then having a feeder and a fuse disconnect for it or a circuit breaker. If it's a circuit breaker, that your circuit breaker will act as your disconnect, and also you will act as um, as overcaptation device. So I size it base 135 and go down on that circuit breaker, um, unless the manufacturer recommend otherwise. Always. So that's um, here's a couple of examples, guys. Now for motors, when you size it for motors, I strongly suggest going to these sheets. These are from Cutler Hammer, directly from capacitor sizing. So here's an example. For example, I have the most common motor typically is um, this is my 1800 four pole. 1800 four pole, they'll give you 1750 RPM. Uh, 1800 RPM four pole. Sizing a capacitor here for you. Uh, look, uh, I, uh, let's just say we have a big boy, a 50 horsepower motor these are horsepower and i want to size the capacitor for that baby i can size a 10 k var right next to that offender and tie it to the line side the load side of a overload and that will offset and correct the power factor up to i believe they go here between 96 uh, 90 92 to 97 depending how loaded the motor is so it takes you between 90, that correction will take you from 92 to 97 that's exactly where i want to be <clears throat> So that's for um, a U-frame. Typically, the one that we use is T-frame, the most typical one, T-frame and design B. And believe it or not, it's different by design and by frame. U-frame is the old frame, B-frame, um, T-frame is the new, and design B is the most typical design motor. So my default will be the bottom if I don't know anything about the motor that we're installing. Any comments, guys? So I know now I don't have to do calculation for motors. I can get it from directly from these sheets. Then it goes even further than that. Uh, there's another sheet. This is again from Cutler Hammer. Here's my 480. Look what happened. See the same thing KW that I just saw, K var, the same K var, thing K var that I sized. Look what it tells you. Here's how much amps that baby is going to suck out of the system at 483 phase. Here's the size of the wire they recommend. Would you use anything less than 12? No. no. So they said 14, but we never use anything less than 12. And this is the size of the fuse that you can put on it. And this is the size of a disconnect directly from this sheet. The disconnect are size based on 1.35. The overcam detection device, their size based on 1.35. And they go up on these sheets. I checked a few of them. I typically go down unless I, I know otherwise. But if you have these sheet guys from Color Hammer, I would be, I wouldn't hesitate. And if I know a fuse uh, switch that I'm using, um, if I'm using a circuit breaker, 
what I would use the size here, the amp size, I would use for the same for a circuit breaker. So if I'm using a circuit breaker, my circuit breaker will act as my disconnect as well as my overcompetition device for the for the capacitor. Any comments, guys? So these are really nice sheets to have. Um, do you guys, uh, Dave, do you guys have any sheets that you use in particular? Or So that's... Okay, so that's... Uh, so what I um, not very often. So I have um, I have two sheets for you guys. Sheet uh, nine, it would size does calculation to size uh, at the system level. At the system level, this is worksheet. This is capacitor calculation for systems, meaning you go to the service and you figure out what the watts, the kilowatts there, and use correct right at the capacitor. That's a poor man way, or woman, by the way. I keep saying poor man or poor, man or poor woman. <laughs> so here's what I did, just to give you an idea what this is. I have system one, two, three. These are complete separate system, have nothing to do with each other. And um, for system, the voltage is 480. You could, they could also be 208, by the way. Um, here's the KW. These are measured worst scenario KW that we have here. KW, 135, 180, and 420. These are how much KW, literally KW, I get out of my system. They, the original power factor is 70, 75, 80. These are bad power factor. We'll be penalized if we keep them. And I am required to correct them to anything in the 90s. So I, I did one for 90, 92, 93. Typically, you go anywhere in the 90s. <clears throat> so... Then the first thing you need to do from the sheet that I showed you guys, that sheet, you can go get that factor based on what the original and what you're re reaching for, what your original power factor, what you want to correct for. Then you multiply the F factor by the KW that you measured in your system. So you get you, then you get you the KVAR. Can you see the KVAR that you need to add? Then, of course, you have to go to the next standard. That's why it's always nice to correct to the lower 90s because you almost always go up when you go to the next standard KVAR. So I need 72, I get went to 75. I need 98, I went to 100. I need 149, I went to 150. These are actual capacitor sizes from Callahan. Because when you size, you size for actual equipment in the field. Okay, so now I know the size of my capacitor. Next, I need my brand circuit, very easy. Find the amps. Very easy, like any other load, divide by the voltage and the multiplier for the three phase, 1.73. Got me 90 amps, multiply by 135, that's the code says so. You have, you can't go lower than that. So you went to 122 and size my conductor for number one. Same thing for each and every one of them. The second thing you need to do <clears throat> is um, I'm gonna go directly to the disconnect. Uh, here's my disconnect, where's my disconnect? So um, my branch circuit, EM. Down, oh, yeah. <laughs> my disconnect is right here, the same thing, what, same calculation, but I have to go to the standard disconnect, which is, uh, um, you know, industry standard 60, uh, 30, 60, 100, multiple of 100. DeWalt book has all of these standards. So I went to a 200 here, 200, and 200 and 400 for these. And you know why I went to these from industry standards, because I don't have 300 disconnects. Okay, and then the last thing you go to is the overcompetition device. Look, I did the same calculation. Now the code says as low as practical. How do you define as low as practical? So I use the same multiplier because I want to protect my conductors anyway. So, but I went down though. I went from 122 to 110. So I'm conservative. If you guys go to the calculation, color hammer, they are most likely they go a lot of times up, but I'm like to be, unless I know what the manufacturer is, I like to go down. Then I protected my conductors. <laughs> That's what my concern is, protecting my conductors. Same thing in each one of in each one of these. Any comments, guys? Any questions about that? So that's my capacitor bank at the system level. And then sizing the conduit and, and the conductors and the equipment ground conductor, you guys are very familiar with. The last one I want to go over is um, number 10, which is now at the motor level. This is worksheet 10, capacitor calculation for motors three phase. Now this is correcting, that's what we should do. We correct as we design to the motor level. Um, and sometimes guys, the manufacturers of chillers and all this stuff, they actually have a capacitor part of the chiller that corrects the power factor at the offender level. So 
Um, okay, now to correct it um, at the offender level, you need to know a little bit more about the equipment though. So here's my equipment. I have a 30 horsepower air handling unit and um, 125 uh, motor and 250. These are all equipment, air handling unit. Uh, it could be a, um, a fan, an exhaust fan, a pump. All these my equipment in horsepower known the voltage the system voltage is 480 obviously their voltage will be 460 but i care less i'm looking at the system voltage the power factor in new i need to correct to 95 power factor and and the information about the motors are the frame design and rpm are given here tb is the frame is t design is b and rpm all of them are 1800 rpm typical you know these are kind of the assumption unless you know otherwise it's easy to assume these then um then directly from the sheet i say cap sheet guys the sheet that i showed you a second ago for motors you can go and no calculation needed no f factor you can go and find the capacitors 8 25 and 60 will be for each one of these motors right directly to them then uh, you find the full load amp very easy then you multiply by 1.25 to size the conductors i have 13.5 I could have gone with number 14, but never go with, we never go with less than number 12. And number eight and number three, three phase each. Then um, my overcome protection device, my disconnect, the same thing, 122. What's that? That, that? I did, I did, um, so I screwed you guys up here. I did, uh, did I do that right? 72. No, these are, can you, uh, I was sleeping here, guys, so. <laughs> so you're going to take the same 10 amps, really, this should be 41. I did them right, but I didn't do the calculation. Can you guys do me a favor? This where these should be here. Same calculation that we did here. She said 97 here and 41 and 13.5. I forgot when I copied, I must have uh, not changed them. Could you please change these? Sorry for that. So here's my 13. It will give me 30. And then my 41 will give me 60. And my 97 will give me 100. <laughs> That's um, when I was drinking pop. <laughs> so that's copy with the sheet i copied it and I, I i must have slept through it uh my apology again so this should be um copied right in here basically because same calculation we don't uh there you go and this one is right here it's easier done than okay okay so that's um <laughs> It's hard to do, yeah to do that right before the evaluation too. Anyway, you will uh, you'll correct that one, and then the rest is history, guys. You take the overcome protection device. I always always go down on the overcome protection device. So that's all I have. One little thing left. I tried to do an overcome protection device for capacitors. I don't know if ever if you guys ever done that. They have something called rupture, uh, tank rupture curve. I couldn't find it though. Um, so long story short, they have a rupture tank rupture curve that you're supposed to go to the left of that tank rupture curve. I, I just couldn't find that tank, the capacitor give me that curve, so I, I didn't do one for you. That's all I have. Thank you guys for listening to chat for 16 hours, most of you. I hope uh, I learned a lot from you, so I hope you learned a few things. And um, well, we'll see you guys around. Thank uh, you. So everybody, Chad uh, is an instructor at Dunley, but our training branch is administered to go to contact with them. So uh, if you want to get a hold of Chad, you have to call him at Dunley. At Dunley, not at the Dakota County Technical College. Chad has a lot of great information on YouTube, a lot of tutorials and, and sessions like this, training sessions that are free to look at on Jeff is an alumni, and so is Lisa. I think that's the two that we have the ones that are uh, alumni of Dunley. Uh, so the last thing we need to do is thank Jeff for coming here for a couple of us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And since our grant was administered to the CTC, they required us to do this evaluation. So please do an evaluation right now. Chad's last name is K U R B I. And uh, the training kind of holds up the basics and the client.